Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Super Bowl 53 prediction and analysis. Well, for the fanatic this past week for conference championship weekend, after doing so well in the divisional round, going a perfect 4 0 straight up, this week, guys, what the difference at 500. Um, I am one of those fans, just like most of the NFL community that were incredibly shocked, disappointed, and frustrated with how both endings of the games went, <clears throat> both in the AFC and the NFC side. Um, so, you know, trust me, I was all upset uh, when uh, Zerline kicked the 57-yarder, the blown call by the refs on that pass interference that should have been made uh, by Coleman, uh, or, yeah, by Coleman on Tommy Lee Lewis was one of the worst blown calls I've ever seen in the game of football. And maybe, you know, and definitely one of the worst in just general sports in recent history um, with blown calls. Um, but I do want to congratulate the Rams and the Saints for getting to the Super Bowl. Um, they are, you know, they were able to make the plays in the, in the way they were able to do it. Uh, but for me now, for this year, uh, since I went 1-1, one one, now we're all, <clears throat> we're all for the postseason. I am six and four, and straight up, um, I wanted uh, straight up. I have a record now, of 165, 99 and two, so that equals about 62 and a half percent. So, I'm at around my season average about picking games that you know every year. So I am happy with that. I wanted to get into 64, 65 range, but definitely, you know, as the year went on, uh, it was tough uh, for some of the games. But that's how that's how usually every week is. So they hit 62.5% for the year for straight up average is great. And I also want to thank everybody <clears throat> for uh, watching my videos this year so far. Um, I know it's been a uh, different year than me from usual. <clears throat> I know that uh, usually I would come out with videos. But of all the work I had to do on my schedule, it was tough to get them. I am planning on making videos next year for the next season. Though I don't know how my schedule is going to go and how much time. If I'm going to be able to do the in-depth videos like I was able to in the past, but I will promise all my viewers out there that I will make videos for the 2019-2020 season. But I do want to thank everybody that watched the videos, and uh, and I will make a recap video uh, like I did the last couple years in the next week or two. Talk about everything for the season, <clears throat> and definitely some next season storylines that I'm interested in, just like everybody else's. Um, let's see, so I went over that. Let me go over both conference games real quickly. The NFC one, uh, boy, was that a uh, interesting swing of the game. Um, the Rams uh, were they got down thirteen to nothing, <clears throat> and the way the Saints were moving the ball, especially using Alvin Kamara as a receiver, I, I thought that would have been the uh, X factor of the whole game. But at, but at, really after that first half, Kamara really got shut down. And the Rams, uh, the Rams' run defense shut down the Saints' rushing offense. I believe they had about, what, 20 carries um, for about 40 yards, which is really impressive <coughs> considering how well, excuse me, I'm a little bit cold, um, with how the Saints team had run the ball pretty much most of this year. Um, and that was the difference. And Drew Brees, after that first quarter, really could not make that many plays. Uh, to be effective, in my opinion. I uh, I was surprised by that. But after I thought about it, yeah, they had 48 total rushing yards as an offense. But as I thought about it, you know, ever since the Dallas Cowboys game, um, the Saints offense really has not been the same. Um, the Saints defense really what's carried it. You know, Drew Brees and them put up 28 points against Tampa, but if you look at most of that game, that was a pretty competitive game between the Bucks. And the Saints for the most part. Then the game where they played Carolina, that was a defensive game won by the Saints defense where, you know, Breeze and that offense only put up 12 points. And if Cam Newton had held to your shoulder, you could argue they could have lost that game. Uh, <clears throat> then they finally had one bright shining moment against uh, Pittsburgh where they put up 31 points. Even though they had, you know, three turnovers, they get blown up by the Panthers in a meaningless game. And they get held to 20 and 23 the next two games for an offense that put up points of 48, 51, uh, 34, you know, they were getting into the 30s most weeks. After that Cowboy game, they couldn't really even reach over 30 one other time. 
So, you know, there was correlation there. Uh, but I, you know, and look, I'll say this with the Rams. I thought it was a pretty gutsy move by Sean McVay to basically have Todd Gurley, after about four plays, basically become a non-factor and C.J. <coughs> <clears throat> C.J. Anderson be the primary running back. Um, C.J. Anderson did not do really much of anything. Um, he only had about 30 yards. But this comes to me where, you know, hey, Todd Gurley, after the game, said he was playing sorry. So obviously he felt that he was not prepared or playing up to the standard that he is expect that he expect himself to play. And I commend him for that. But I think a lot of people are going to wonder, man, you paid $60 million in the offseason for the best running back in football this year. And the fact that you just have him sitting there with a helmet on, you know, and he's not hurt. You know, that's that's great humility, but just extreme questioning by the Rams uh, coaching staff. And if they would have lost that game, that would have been the number one thing that all Rams fans could have pointed to. Is the reason why they lost the game. <clears throat> but I thought Jared Goff, as the game went on after he had that rough first quarter, he was able to outplay Drew Brees. He played an efficient game. He made big throws and key throws in order to get them in positions. Brandon Cooks had a fantastic game. Five receptions for over 100 yards. First 100-yard game since week 11. And also, I was just impressed with how the Rams were able to hold on from that first quarter because they only held six points after those first two drives. If they would have got those two touchdowns there, the game could have probably been over at that point, being down possibly 21 nothing to the Saints. But I do want to say this about, you know, if anyone wants my pick, Look, about the call that was in the game that basically defined the game. Uh, that pass interference call. Yes, I do believe that that was a blatant miss. That was a horrible miss call uh, by, <coughs> by that officiating crew. And I believe that official deserves to be fired. And I believe that entire staff by uh, Bill Vinovich, I believe, that entire staff, including him, needs to be demoted a whole level. Okay, so I, I do agree with that. But for all the Saints fans that are, you know, you know, whining and putting up the billboards, putting up, you know, Gail Benson, their owner, you know, the wife of uh, Tom Benson, saying it was an unfair travesty that they, they couldn't get into the game. Yes, you're right. You probably would have won. But you know what happened? You had the ball in overtime. The Rams ended up kicking a field goal to tie the game. Drew Brees in that offense choked it out. He choked. You know, okay, well, he got pressured by Fowler, but Drew Brees threw up a duck right to Josh, jo right to John Johnson, who had the easiest interception of his life. You had a chance to win the game. You had a chance to do it. Okay, so you know, so I, I am a little frustrated with how the Saints. I get their frustration. You know what? Maybe they're just really angry about it, and you know they're gonna take it out on the Rams next year when they go to Los Angeles. But you know, just 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 calm down a bit there, because you still had a chance to win the game. Drew Brees threw that pick, you know, in the game. You know, how about Sean Payton? Hey, it's first down. You don't have to have two throws. You know, you could have ran the ball three straight times, forced the Rams to use their timeouts. Take the field goal and see what happens there. <clears throat> but yes, that's the thing. I, I really look at the Saints and say, look, you don't need to sue the league. And you're not going to get this Article 1, you know, whatever rule saying that the, you know, the commissioner, the commissioner's not going to do that. Okay. And I understand it would be great. But do you think Cowboy, do you really, you know, do you really want, you know, every fan base? So in that 2014 year, should the, should the Lions have played the Packers? Or should the Cowboys have played Seattle? If we were going to use that rule, that would have been the right call. That would have been the justifiable call for those fan bases. Okay? And, yeah, that some of those, they were clear. Or, well, well maybe the Detroit one. But, yeah, those were clear about what happened there. If you're really angry about a situation where it unravels. Because I'm pretty sure all those fan bases in that 2014 season. The Lions fan base against the Cowboys. The Cowboys fan base against the Packers, and even the Packers fan base probably choked against the Seahawks, all would have felt that same way. <coughs> that they were robbed of that opportunity. But you know what? They're not going to apply that rule. And for New Orleans, look, you're still in a good position. But realize that you had a decent amount of part on your part with Sean Payton, with Drew Brees, that they could have, you know, they could have righted that ship, 
you know, past that call. But yeah, that is the pivotal call of the game, and I get your frustration. And you're rightfully to be frustrated. But to sue the league, for the owner to basically say, we're going to sh shift the rules out of anger, you know, Saint Saints fans for the integrity of the game. Remember, you're the team that has Bounty Gate. You know, so, yeah, integrity and Bounty Gate with your franchise kind of is a little rich. Okay? So, th you know, those are my thoughts on that. You know, again. And then in the AF... <coughs> then in the AFC side... Congrats to the Patriots for uh, having a, you know, a very good game plan. They basically built Parcells the game. They said shorten the game against Patrick Mahomes, um, and it worked. And that first half, if you, you know, that first half, nobody would have ever thought, even the most diehard Pats fans would have thought that the Pats offense, or the Pats defense would have shut down Patrick Mahomes and that offense to no points. And 32 total yards, which is downright absurd with how fast that offense is, of how creative that offense is, and how many points they've been able to score. That was the first time since week four of the 2016 year that an Andy Reid offense by the Chiefs was shut out in the first half. And that was a huge part of this game that that was important. It, it, yeah, that was. That was a huge part. So that's why I don't feel as bad, you know, for Chief fans. I feel actually worse for Saint fans than I do Chief fans. Because you know what? You had that first half to try to do something against the defense that, uh, on the road, got torched by Blake Bortles. Got lit up, you know, got 34 points put on by Mariota. You know, you could have done that same thing. So kudos to them. <clears throat> and also, again, I just thought the Pats, they were able to convert third down at a very big rate. 13 of 19. Uh, and you're not going to win games if you convert that many. Especially the three on, on the overtime drive. <clears throat> and, you know, I thought Brady, he played an efficient game. He came through when he needed to. But through, throughout the game, he was just kind of, you know, just throwing short passes. James White had a couple drops early on screens that they were able to get one for about 30 yards later. Um, but Edelman came up huge. <clears throat> it's, it's kind of amazing, actually. I, I found this out during the game. That he has the second most postseason receptions of all time behind Jerry Rice. <laughs> that That's pretty amazing. But... I do think that's more of the fact that he's on the Patriots and gets to play that many games. Kudos to him for getting that spot, because getting that many receptions, that does have to have a good amount of ability. But I do think it's 49, <coughs> 45% ability, 55% he's on the Patriots. He gets in the postseason every year. He's been on that team since 2009. Yeah, so, you know, you, you've had enough games. Um, but then if you look at it, <coughs> Gronk came up huge. Especially on that last drive, he had a solid game. Um, his, like, most receiving yards probably since that Kansas City game the last time. So that was huge, especially with that play on Barry. Um, and I just thought, again, that the key stat is going to be the Pats had the ball for about 44 minutes. The Chiefs had it for 21. And that was huge because in, the, in that 21 minutes, the Chiefs put up 31 points. The Chiefs offense showed you in that second half how if you can get turn, you know, they got a couple turnovers, they got a couple breaks their way. <clears> that they could score <clears throat> at will and they could score easily. But I look at, you know, that last drive as well. That defense, the way you stop a great pass rush is by how the Pats were doing it. Basically, Tom Brady has the ball with about two seconds or less. You throw the football, they can't generate any pass rush because they did not get to him. They did not sack him one time. In fact, in both postseason games against very good pass rushers, let's look at some of the talent he's gone up against you know, in the front sevens of the last few weeks. He's gone up against Joey Bosa, Melvin Ingram, uh, Brandon Meebane, you know, one of the, one of the better defense. Damian Square's a guy I like. Uh, Justin Houston, D. Ford, uh, Chris Jones. Uh, these are all talented, you know, outside linebackers and pass rushers, and they've only hit him three times in two games. That's a tremendous job to the offensive linemen of the Patriots, and most of those guys are really unknown picks or just kind of, you know, going out there. Like, you have guys like Trent Brown, David Andrews, Shaq Mason, uh, Joe Thune, you know. Kudos to Dante Skarnecchia for, you know, getting that offensive line prepared that well <coughs> to get those kind of pass rushers away from Tom Brady. 
But, you know, again, but I do want to give the Chiefs credit. They were able to, you know, make it a game in the second half. Um, I thought that, you know, they were able to, you know, use the passing game very effectively. Damian Williams, you know, he really wasn't that much of a threat on the ground, but he was through the air because I think he had about <clears throat> 60, 80 yards receiving and two touchdowns. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> I know people are going to be angry that, you know, the Pats got a BS roughing the passer call, which is true. That's true. You can gripe about that because that was, Chris Jones just touched him in the chest and there was nothing wrong with that. It wasn't a helmet hit or anything like that. That was a BS call, and I agree with that. But everybody complaining, especially Andy Reid, about the D Ford offside call. If you look at the line of scrimmage, his, enti- his entire first half of his body is across the line of scrimmage. That is a flag. And you know what? He's like, oh, you know, we should have been warned. No, that's dumb. <clears throat> because if you were warned every single time that you were offside, you would... You would never have offside penalty if you, you know, if the ref said, hey, you're offside. And yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's on D4. And you know what? That defense, you shouldn't have given up that many third downs. You shouldn't have let Julian Edelman run right up the middle of the field on two consecutive plays there. Um, and look, I, I really feel, you know, for Chief fans, this is going to be one of those things that, look, they have a bright future ahead of them. Honestly, in my opinion, they are the second best team in the AFC going into next year. And there's really nobody close with the Chiefs, and they're going to get another shot at the Patriots. However, when I just look at Andy Reid, and I look at that Chiefs' future, they got some questions on their hands. Who are they going to hire a defensive coordinator? What are they going to do with guys like Justin Houston? What are they going to do with a guy like Eric Berry, who, you know, got <coughs> got paid $78 million over six years? Um, and he, now he's only played, he's only started three games over the last two years from that heel injury. If he gets knocked down again, I, you know, I am being dead serious about this. I think it'll be time to consider the Chiefs to cut him. Because I am not kind of I am not spending that money. I'm not spending that type of money on a guy that I'm getting very little production from. I know Chief fans might be angry. It's like, oh, you're being heartless. You know what? It's a great story. And I wish Eric Berry, you know, the best of his career after Kansas City. And it was great that he beat cancer, and I'm happy that he's back in the league and he won the comeback player of the year. But you know what? Just like with Ryan Shazier and all that, you know, eventually at the end of the day, the bottom line is the bottom line. And if Eric Berry's not producing or not reliable anymore at his age, I am not willing as, you know, as a, if I was the Chiefs, to pay that kind of cap hit <coughs> to get that guy from Berry. And Justin Houston, the same thing. Justin Houston and, and Berry, here, here's how I'll, I'll define it. Justin Houston is the story of, they have talent on that defense that can put up Justin Houston production at a cheaper rate, maybe besides D Ford, who will probably, you know, won somewhere around there. Maybe a little bit less than Houston, but he'll want his money. But you have D Ford and Chris Jones that can replace Justin Houston. The key thing is Justin Houston has been a pretty solid contributor. The Eric Berry argument is the other way around, where Eric Berry's a health issue, but you don't really have the talent, because I don't think Daniel Sorensen or uh, Aaron Murray or any other safety you can get back there, unless they get Earl Thomas, you know, there's really not a safety that's going to be available that you could argue could produce to Eric Berry's level when he's healthy. But the problem is he's health, you know, his health is the problem. So those are going to to be two concerns. Damian Williams, you know, can they find another running back? Because Damian Williams, he's done a good job, and I do believe he deserves to stay on that roster. But I think people after the championship game will consider, do we need another competing back? Former committee because I believe Spencer Ware and Charkandrick West should both be gone at this point. And or do we, as you know, the Chiefs, what do we do that you know, do we get another running back or do we rely on Damian Williams to be our main back going into next year? I don't know if you know I would be able to do that. <clears throat> and then the other big question is Tyreek Hill has one year left on his contract. I do he will be eligible to get a contract extension now, and I do think it is time for the Chiefs to get that contract extension signed now with one year left. I'd be willing to pay Tyreek Hill between 65 to $75 million. He's a 13 to $15 million receiver, in my opinion. But we will see what the Chiefs do. I would pay him that kind of money because I believe he's that talented of a player. <clears throat> also, same thing for Michael Thomas. For the Saints, they shouldn't do what they did with Brandon Cooks. They were fortunate to have Michael Thomas. They need to sign Michael Thomas to a long-term deal. Um, and for the Patriots, 
Congratulations. Eight straight conference title games, three straight Super Bowls. They join the Bills and Dolphins as the only teams that have th- to make three straight Super Bowls. It is downright remarkable what they're doing in this sport, in this kind of era where free agency, people are moving everywhere. They keep getting pieces in and out, in and out. And as long as they have Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, they can, you know, they prove of all the different kind of pieces that they can win, you know, no matter who, who's there. You know, and that's the thing. I know people were angry, you know, oh, it's rigged. You know, the Patriots, you know, they, they got all the breaks again. I get that. But you know what? At the end of the day, that's not the Patriots' fault that D4 didn't know to jump off. It's not the Pats' fault that Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram could not get to the pass rush. It's not the Pats' fault for all those errors. <clears throat> and if you want to stop the Pats, what you have to do is beat them. It's great to complain about it. I mean, everybody has the right to complain about it. Heck, I'm sick of them as a from a personal standpoint. I am sick of them myself that they're going to their ninth Super Bowl under Brady and Belichick. But you know what? At the end of the day, I respect that even through the clouds of Spygate, Deflategate, um, you know, just the way they run that organization, the fact that they are the most corporate, they, they are the perfect definition, in my opinion, of corporate America at its best and at its worst with how they are all robots in that team. That, you know, for, for, maybe besides Gronk. That they're all robots. They say nothing. They hide everything in that organization. You don't know really what's going on. But at the same time, year after year after year, they put out a product that is reliable, consist- <clears throat> consistent, and the same. And really, outside of sports, that's what everybody wants out of a product that they buy, you know, as a, as a good, as entertainment. You want the same quality every single year. And that's what the Pats have done for the last 18 or 17, 18 years on probably the greatest football dynasty ever and one of the greatest dynasties and one of the greatest runs in sports history. And that's why I just want to say the Pats fans. Shout out to Andrew Warren, my friend, fellow prognosticator. Job well done for the Pats. And best of luck to them in the Super Bowl, in Super Bowl 53. <clears throat> All right, it's time for my pick for Super Bowl 53. In this game, the New England Patriots and the Rams. Uh, the Pats are like about a two-point favorite. I, and I'm going to take the Patriots here. Patriots Patriots over the Rams. Uh, and I'll explain I'll explain this. I'm taking the New England Patriots over the LA Rams. Um, the reason is, is that I just can't go against Brady and Belichick at this point. <clears throat> this is a great <clears throat> contrast between, uh, you know, how the Patriots have done it Versus the Rams. The Patriots have gotten guys, basically, the free agents of Adrian Claiborne's and Rex Burkhead's and Jeremy Hill's and Julian Edelman's and Philip Dorsett's and Cordero Patterson's. They get a bunch of has been, you know, they get a bunch of has been's, journeyman's, busts. They all put them together <clears throat> offensively and then defensively, kind of the same thing. Defense has more, you know, experienced talent. But guys like, you know, Lawrence Guy and Trey Flowers and Dietrich Wise and J.C. Jackson, you know, they get all those guys together with a couple of, you know, solid pieces offensively that have been consistent. <clears throat> and Tom Brady, uh, Edelman, Gronk. Um, and then on defense, you have Hightower, you have Chung, you have McCourty, and you have Gilmore versus the Rams, who basically have been one of the better free agency teams in the recent time that they, in the free agency, they brought in Aqib Tlaib. They brought in Marcus Peters. They brought in Sam Shields. They brought in Nadamik and Sue. They had the Marcus Jordan on our franchise tag. They brought in Brandon Cooks. They re-signed Todd Gurley. They re-signed Aaron Donald. They re-signed Brandon Cooks. And they have Jared Goff, the number one pick. You have a guy that, you know, in Belichick that's playing... That's participating in what is 11 for 12th or 13th total Super Bowl in his career. And Sean McVay, this is the first Super Bowl he's ever been in, uh, you know, for the Rams. And their first one, ironically, on the same day, 17 years from <clears throat> the first Pats Rams Super Bowl. And also, I do want to congratulate Jared Goff. I heard the stat earlier. He is the youngest number one overall quarterback to get to the Super Bowl or first round pick. That would have been last year with Carson Wentz. But he didn't play in it. So, you know, kudos to Jared Goff in that way. 
And it's funny because it's funny how if you really looked at, you know, Brady and golf, it's kind of similar to what Brady and Manning is, except Brady is really, you know, the Hall of Fame all-time GOAT guy, and golf's the guy really with the number one overall pick that nobody's, you know, nobody's going to give a chance to. Though he's the number one pick. People believed in Jared Goff much more than they did Tom Brady at the time. But the reason why I'm taking the Patriots here is because I look at the Rams' defense, and they really only have two big assets here. Sue and Don. You know, Sue and Donald are going to be the key in this game to stop the Pats running game. Because they're going to go up against Sony Michelle, who's done a very good job this year, and he's become, for the first time in the last few years, the main running back for this team. <clears throat> Jeremy, Jeremy Hill, Rex Burkhead, those guys could go. Honestly. The Rex might stay because I think he has another year left, and he and James are good pass catching backs, and Rex has a little more power on him. But Sony Michelle has become the primary running back for this team, which I'm, you know, really impressed with. And the key thing, you know, for, for the Rams is can Sue and Donald penetrate to force Tom Brady to throw? And here, here's the thing. I also look at the Pats where, you know, they're more disciplined than the Rams. The Rams have to leave. The Rams have Peters. <clears throat> All you have to do is go back in that Cowboy game where Tlaib and Cooper, you know, or it was Peters and Cooper that got tagged, uh, tied together, and uh, Peters shoved uh, Cooper, and they got they got a flag. So. Definitely with discipline, I'll give J.C. Jackson and Gilmore the edge there. I know Tlaib and Peters have more talent, but the discipline edge goes to <laughs> the Pats there. Tight end, the Pats have a huge edge there with Gronkowski because Higby and Everett, they're really guys that are just there for the Rams. They could be a secret weapon for the Rams, you know, because nobody really, you know, cares about Tyler Higby or Gerald Everett, and they really didn't make as many big plays, though Higby did make the catch <clears throat> they got Zerline in field goal range. But also look at the Pats linebackers. I think that edge goes to the Pats. And I just feel like the Pats have played more disciplined and more consistent defense compared to <clears throat> the Rams defense has this entire year, especially in the back end. Um, and also I think the disadvantage that the Rams have is at the safety position because I know Joyner's good and Josh Johnson's good, but I'll take McCourty and Chung in that situation over... The Rams safeties. Also, I feel like, again, the Rams have to use Todd Gurley in this game. Look, Sean McVay, he should look at Bill Belichick and look what happened last time. You got away with that win because you were able to win the game. But if you're not able to win the game, and C.J. Anderson, who, again, has done a very good job, and if I'm the Rams, I sign him to a law, or I sign him to an extension in the offseason, become the primary number two back. I think he has earned that. With how he's done over the last four or five weeks, <clears throat> he has found a home as Todd Gurley's compliment. However, this would, I think, be equivalent to what Bill Belichick did last year in the Super Bowl with Malcolm Butler. Because if this game is close, and if Todd Gurley, again, he's having you know more struggles, he's not playing well, you kind of have to put that aside, Sean, and say, look, this is the Super Bowl. You are the most talented running back in the National Football League and you are the best all-around running back in the NFL by most people's opinions, I think Zeke is a close number two. He needs to make plays. He needs to be able to make plays and exploit the Pats defense <clears throat> just like the Pats are going to try with James White. Because they saw what Alvin Kamara was doing. They know they can do that with James White in this game in the Super Bowl. And also, again, I, I, I think an advantage <clears throat> for um, the Rams in this way is Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips um, knows how to play Tom Brady with this kind of defense. Tlaib knows for being in Denver. You know, they have guys in Tlaib and Brandon Cooks that have played with and <coughs> played with and against Brady recently in big games. And Tlaib and uh, Phillips will definitely go over what they did in the 2015 AFC title game. I don't think they have the outside pass rushers because they, they really just have Fowler on the outside that really, you know, can produce a threat. Nobody else really, you know, can do that kind of same thing. But I think that's going to be a key too. Can Wade Phillips 
make a kind of blueprint, or can he get the Rams defense to be motivated enough to get that kind of blueprint like I did against Denver, where Brady, <clears throat> that offensive line crumbled the year Skarniecki left, and he got hit about 18, 20 times, and they really couldn't do anything, even though that game was a two-point game. But at the end of the day, just for me, I can't take the Rams here. I feel like, again, the Rams are a great story. The Rams are a great player infused story. Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown, and all these great players that want money should love that the Rams are at this spot because they know that player driven futures are ahead for the league. And, if, you know, you could spend this money and prove that talent does pay off or paying talent in the New York Yankee or LA Laker or big city type way it works out. Job well done there. But at the same time, the experience, the consistency, the edge of, you know, hey, you know, people, you know, people don't want us to succeed. We're too old. We're too slow. You know, people are tired of us. That motivates too. Like everybody said, yeah, the Rams are going to be motivated, you know, because they're going to be tired of hearing about Brady and Belichick and Dynasty and all this crap about, you know, Boston and their success and, you know, all that. But, you know, the Pats are going to be, you know, motivated too, saying, yeah, you know what? People hate seeing us every year. People hate seeing us win. But you know what? That's what drives us. You hating us drives us. Because all we want to do is just have to shut you up and have to see that, you know, Lombardi Trophy come to Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick in one Patriot way once again. But I'm, ta <coughs> I'm taking the Pats here because of experience. I feel that their defense is a little bit better than the Rams at this point. Um, and I also feel that they're going to be more disciplined. And I just don't think Jared Goff will get the luxury of Brady. Or, well, I, I don't think that they'll be able to be able to make enough plays in that game to just kind of match what Brady's doing. Because the, the Pats know the formula. All the offensive line has to do is hold up against Donald and Sue. And they held up against Ingram and Bosa. They held up against uh, Ford, Houston, and Jones. I think they can hold up enough, again, against the Rams to go up against that secondary in the middle to um, be able to win this game. I, I think it's going to be competitive. And I think Jared Goff and the Rams are going to, you know, Sean McVay is kind of like a lot like Dabo here. <clears throat> Sean's a young guy. Sean's motivated. You know, Sean's the bright new flame in the NFL. And he's going to, you know, try to confuse the patch. He's going to try to infuse his young guys to knock out the old guys, you know, with more passion and more motivation. But I just think, again, the Pats in this situation, they're going to be more disciplined. They're more experienced. And I'll just trust Brady and them one more time in Atlanta being able to pull out a game-winning drive. <coughs> and he'll avenge what happened last year with that bump. Actually, you know, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll go this far. I'm probably going to be wrong about this. I think the Pats-Rams game ends in the reversal of fortune for the Patriots where Jared Goff or Ram fumbles in the last two minutes and Brady and them win it that way. I'll, I'll, I'll put that on record. I will say that. Um, I, I think that's how the game's going to end. I think it could be that close. But I'm taking the Patriots here. More experienced. They know how to stop a good pass rush. Uh, the Rams' corners are, you know, again, more aggressive, more... On this one, they may be peaking a little more, trying to get the Brady. That may allow Edelman and Hogan to, you know, get open. And also, again, I I just feel like the Jared Goff, you know, with that offensive line with the Rams, they got some pressure on him. And I think, again, Trey Flowers can do, you know, Trey Flowers, Hightower, they can make enough plays defensively to uh, shut down the uh, Rams offense enough for the Pats to be able to win. So those are my, uh, that's, that's my pick in the Super Bowl. Uh, and I'll even give a score. I'm going to say the Patriots win the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 53. I will say Pats 28, the Rams 24. I'll go 28-24 uh, New England over the Rams. So that's it. So until the next couple weeks where I do a full season review and a preview of next year, this is Matt the NFL Fanatic uh, signing off. Again, please like, comment, rate, subscribe. Also, check out the NFL YouTube Prognosticators page for great guys like Geo Knows, Half Moon's Picks, Bridgewater's Finest, Billy B, uh, The Waterboy Report, The Electric, uh, the electric uh, Show, 
Stuart Mandel, uh, Johnny Britke, uh, Cody Roy Parker, Keith Bailey, all those guys and gals that do picks just like I do. Please check them out for their Super Bowl thoughts and analysis. And that's it. So until next week, so until the next couple weeks, this is Matthew Novak signing off. Until next time, so long.